So as I said, this is the last series in this talk. In, uh, no, this is the last talk in the series. Um, so uh, our talk is going to be from Professor Miyu, who's based at Castle, uh, which some of you know as the venue for Documenta, so the city venue for Documenta. Um, and I think Miyu is not just the University of Castle, she's also at the Documenta Institute. Um, so me has been historically working on um, issues of transnational migration, mi well, actually more trans transnational flows, including migration, trade, and so on. Uh, and has kind of been thinking about this in quite a large historical perspective, going back to the Silk Road, which is part of the title of today's talk, which is the route from China to Central Asia and into the West from a very long time ago. I'm not going to say more about it because I suspect it's going to be part of Mi's <laughs> talk. Um, and then more recently, it's been thinking about this sort of transnational alliances, uh, communication structures, migration, trade routes, and so on, in a contemporary context of globalization and what happens within that, which doesn't conform to or reproduce you know, kind of big power structures, essentially. So uh, I'm not, not going to say a lot more. I'll just introduce some of Mi's research. She was a curator, the curator of this exhibition and in Cologne uh, called Sai Nofi, which again was looking at how speculative, spec speculative um, proposals, which we've heard a lot of through Gary's talk last week and Baha's talk the week before, can form, part, can form part not just of our current imagination of what the future is, but can construct new forms of futureness as well. And again, part of this exhibition was this polycentric, not Europe-centered uh, idea of how, what the planet will look like from now. And in fact, has looked like for a very long time already, but gets kind of clipped out when we have these kind of Western, uh, Western and North-centered models of globalization. Um, Me is also a curator at the 13th Shanghai Biennale, uh, which was taking place in 2021, hit very badly by COVID lockdown um, procedures, but still um, you know, was was put into practice um, and has more recently moved from a kind of curatorially based practice to one that's thinking more about organizational structures and what artists and people from the art field can do within organizations. Okay. And so this project Common Action Forum is something that I think me is quite involved in, um, which is kind of trying to change not just the aims of practice, but also the venues in which artistic endeavors and curatorial endeavors can take place. So as I said, I don't want to like preempt a lot of what me will be talking about. I'm just going to hand over to me, um, who will now come on, I hope. Are you there? Great. Yeah. Hi. Great. Thanks, Suhail. Some... Thanks, Suhail, for the introduction. Thanks also to Gary for the invitation. Um, I would have loved to follow the previous talks, and I hope there's a chance to catch up on them. Um, so it's an honor to be part of this uh, lecture series, and I hope I'll be able to add something to the poly crisis. Um, I'll do it actually rather with something concrete. Um, so as Suhe already introduced, I've been working with um, the Silk Road as a figure, um, really in many of its meanings, uh, including the historical trade route and, and this, the, the, the cultural transfers that it enabled, but also um, the present um, uh, uh, supra-international uh, supra uh, infrastructure project of um, mostly sponsored by China called the Belt and Road Initiative. So the Silk Road is really many things. Um, and on top of uh, on top of all of these different meanings, it connects very diverse geographical imaginations, um, and this is uh, something that I'm, I'm I'm working on in dialogue with a colleague of mine, uh, Nikolai Smirnov. And we're trying to tease out um, the geographical imaginations that uh, you can observe in different layers of artistic um, practices, but also ideological formations in China and Russia. Um, and so, yeah, so when it comes to the Silk Road, um, it really connects diverse geographical ima imaginations um, that include the one before the emergence of the nation state, where ways of life were purportedly more community-oriented community and in attunement with nature, 
um, but also uh, one that comes at the height of third worldism or internationalism in the 60s and 70s, as well as uh, all these various attempts of rewriting the Western-led globalization today. So these positions are, as you can see, not coherent um, and differently politically motivated. And it is uh, my wish to, to tease out all of these dimensions as an answer to the poly crisis, I suppose, um, but with very concrete uh, visual materials. So one thing that I've, I guess I've been trying to do in the recent years is to, uh, is to monitor um, uh, the so-called cultural diplomacy on the BRI, um, where there's actually very little, uh, especially, or if there, was, if there were any, it would be the sort of very kitschy and, 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 and government-sponsored Silk Road-themed gala uh, or some kind of bilateral uh, painting exhibition that uh, you might see between China and um, a Central Asian nation or um, an African nation. Um, but there are more recent and actually much more alerting um, developments. And this is something that uh, a researcher friend of mine, Emily Vela Bevino has been trying to track. Um, there's a, in her research, she looks at a foundation called Q Contemporary Art, uh, which has its headquarters in Hong Kong, but actually works on contemporary Eastern European art with a, um, an office in Budapest. And they've been doing contemporary abstract um, Eastern European painting shows in Hong Kong. And all of this seems very art historical and neatly curated. But if you drill down a little bit more, and Emily has done a really, really good job in doing that, you will see that the, uh, this foundation is actually connected to a Hong Kong-based property developer, uh, which is expanding its commercial arm in Eastern Europe under the umbrella of BRI, not to mention that it actually subtly exercises political um, influences in, uh, 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 in Hungary. So all of that is to say that all of the the the, the, the Silk Road um, uh, geographical imaginations and cultural diplomacies is not uh, trivial, and and uh, and that will also influence the way that we look at um, artistic practices connected to that. So uh, let me share my screen. Um, which um, so you will see um, this is a diagram that Nikolai and myself developed where we try to find a a, a way to describe what is going on with this geo imagination that uh, 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 we define. Um, what you can observe is the field. It's it's a very dynamic field, um, and you might recognize names of uh, Chinese and Russian artists um, simply because we needed to uh, to 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 play around um, uh, 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 trying to understand what this field means for ourselves. But what what you can see broadly is that there are two poles. On the left hand side is the impulsive universalism, um, sometimes uh, internationalism, um, and on the other hand, the impulse of geospecificity, uh, which can also manifest itself as an anti-universalist um, tendency. Um, and these are the two poles, right? Um, on top of that, you have all these different positions. So you might have one position that's historically placed closer to say the, the universalist pole, but at the same time, it's actually being pulled by the other side, which is the geospecific um, side um, to really illustrate how dynamic this field is and how contradictory things can get. Um, so on the, on the, on the uh, geospecific side of this diagram, um, uh, we 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 understand geospecificity as um, something that um, that that is based on local specific context, often connected to certain traditional knowledge forms, lifestyles, 
Um, and it has been uh, quite a leading force in the arts, we have to say, since the 80s. Um, and it can be perceived as emancipatory and progressive if it concerns a case of um, um, ethnic minority and non-independence, but it can also become something nationalistic and reactionary if you apply it to a sovereign state uh, or in an official rhetoric. Um, on the other hand, the universalist pull, um, uh, pull of it, um, that's where um, broadly we have um, a universalist, uh, we have an internationalist um, politics where uh, 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 cultural relativism is um, looked down upon. Uh, but I think we have less and less of uh, oppositions to that. That gravitate towards that pole these days. Um, so this is more of a mental exercise and a conceptual diagram that help, helps us um, to situate different works. And I'm actually going to start with very concrete visual materials. Um, and it's quite an experiment um, because as you will see, these are, these are uh, works that belong to different artistic traditions, different uh, uh, lineages, but in the interest of uh, teasing out something more at the level of ideology and cultural diplomacy, I think I'm happy to um, put them together and to ask some perhaps uh, inconvenient questions. Um, so we're starting with the geospecific imaginations. Um, in China, there was uh, back in the 1950s, at the time of, uh, of, of this new nation building project, you had um, the ethno -classif uh, classification project in the political realm, but parallelly in the art academies, um, uh, a, a project called nationalization of oil painting. So many of the key artists uh, that were part of that movement, they emerged uh, from the, uh, the so-called frontier plain air painting movement during the wartime in the 1930s and 40s, when most of the coastal and urban China in, 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 in Eastern China was occupied uh, to various degrees by Japan. Um, and when many artists uh, uh, moved into the, the outback of China and uh, they really uh, uh, were uh, spent time in rural Western China where they got in contact with indigenous cultures. Um, so for example, you have a painter uh, Pan Xunzi spending four months walking in the mountains um, and uh, the celebrated communist um, official painter Dong Siwen copying medieval wall paintings in the Buddhist grottos in Dunhuang, which uh, was historically uh, a, a place um, uh, uh, outside of China's political um, influence. So these were Han ethnic uh, artists. And if these ethnically Han artists incorporated ethnic motifs into the nascent nation, uh, national academic painting tradition in those days, then until today, the works of non-Han Chinese academic artists are still promoted. So often in the style that you see right now, this is from a, a Uyghur artist um, from the local academy, uh, or artist association, so basically official artists painting uh, recognizably ethnic motifs such as singing and dancing scenes and postcard landscapes and all of this, and uh, and 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 uh, uh, some of these uh, works will be included in official painting exhibitions as part of the BRI project, and this is not a Chinese. Only phenomena. So you have it. You have this across all the post-Soviet countries. This is a Uzbek academic painter uh, painting essentially in the same style um, of a scenery, an imagined scenery of the old Silk Road, and um, he was actually commissioned by the Chinese government for um, for this painting to be included in a BRI uh, themed exhibition. But here comes the first inconvenient question, which is if we juxtapose these kind of works, um, academic, ethnic, um, realist, right? 
we juxtapose this kind of work with uh, someone else. Uh, in this case, Liu Xiaodong, who is internationally recognized and acclaimed uh, and also well-sold uh, neorealist painter who uh, hails from also the ac traditional academic painting tradition, but has turned to become a contemporary artist since the 90s. Um, and in this uh, series in question, basically, he went to Xinjiang, uh, to Houtian in, in, in almost the westernmost part of China. Uh, where he um, depicted uh, Muslim jade diggers in this very bare landscape um, on the brink of the Taklamakan Desert. So if we juxtapose these with the paintings that we have just saw, what makes them so different? Can we say that there is something intrinsically different beyond the appearance of depicting ethnic lives? The stylistic characteristics between the official academic art and contemporary art move rather fluidly. And it seems that the determination hinges rather on whether the work serves a minoritarian or majoritarian politics, if not to say the milieu the artists, uh, the artists find themselves in. But even this characterization does not convey the full picture. So here um, is um, a project, a uh, more recent project of um, Liu Chuang. And one can really observe, observe that, that recently a number of internationally acclaimed contemporary Chinese artists have in, ventured into the Western regions to observe life and glean knowledge or in a way uh, refine their artistic skills in what could be called Frontier Plain Air Art 2.0. Um, this is my term, and I think it's slightly mean. Um, but if you look at the content of this um, work, um, of Liu Chang's work, um, he brings to attention um, uh, Bitcoin mining sites in rural Western China, which is also home to a number of minority groups. And he tries to contextualize uh, the question of capital investment within um, uh, 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 within the history of science and popular culture. Um, and he, uh, he 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 tries to juxtapose uh, cutting edge technology, which is uh, Bitcoin mining and all of that, um, with um, uh, questions of uh, ecological uh, damage, but also of minority intelligence. So trying to take a minoritarian, a minoritarian political position. But I would ask if the artist's position is rather detached and, and, and I, I, or to put it more bluntly, what is the politics of this artist? Um, because the drift towards the geospecific um, favors a divergence of epistemology. Uh, this has become uh, not just a trend, um, but also a means rather, sorry, uh, but also the, the ends rather than the means, right? So divergence has become um, the ends rather than just the means to achieve something, where uh, someone like Benjamin Breton would argue that we actually lose sight of technological viability. So uh, Brighton has discerned that uh, the relation between conversion and divergent instrumentality and conversion and divergent epistemology are not the same. So we can imagine stacks, technological stacks, which are technologically diverse, but cosmologically monocultural. And we can imagine stacks which are technologically iso uh, isomorphic, but animated by different uh, cultural imaginations, and currently we have them. So I think um, in this case, many artists are, 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 are doing a service to this sort of um, uh, culturally diverse, uh, but in the end, technologically isomorphic uh, kind of tech imagination. Um, another example that's a little bit more complex is uh, from the artist Shen Xin, um, probably not uh, unfamiliar to some of you. She has um, documented um, a journey with her father in this video from 2014. Um, her late father 
was a painter and had painted a lot of uh, Tibetan landscapes. And she followed her father's journey to Tibet and interviewed him um, where you can sense from this very video um, that she had a largely critical turn uh, tone towards um, her father's um, orientalization of the Tibetans. But a um, few years after, um, Shen Xin would uh, correct her, her, her overtly critical position. She has come to realize that there might be something more, there might be something there in her father's fascination beyond this um, determination of Orientalism. And we started speaking about this in a, um, a, 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 a TV conversation for tra uh, Transformation TV, I think. Um, and it is this space of ambiguity that I think is uh, quite interesting in this case. Um, so these phenomena do not lend themselves easily to an analysis based on post-colonial theories, not least because sometimes it feels as if one already knows the answer and is merely looking for a problem. In the case of Shen Xin, she kind of already knew the answer and she looked for the she, she, she went to the journey with her father um, in, the, in, the, in the original uh, 2014 work. Um, but post-colonialism figures quite uh, in a tricky way in China because it can be applied both to the nation. So you have a China versus the West or China exceptionalism uh, discourse um, and also um, for the discourse of internal colonization. So Xinjiang and Tibet. Mongolia and other regions. Um, and often we find this um, uh, subject of critique uh, moving quite uh, fluidly um, along these different parameters. Um, so, you know, you would have um, back in the 2000s uh, 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 theories um, trying to formulate a more geospecific uh, episteme, such as um, the Bentu or native land um, methodology to describe a Chinese approach to contemporary art, or call for something uh, post-West, um, such as what we had in the uh, Guangzhou Triennale, uh, forgot the year, it was in the 2000s, titled um, Farewell to Post-Colonialism, and this happened parallel to the intellectual project of making a certain reworked version of Confucianism into an obvious candidate to an indigenous post-colonial or decolonial theory. So it is no wonder that Confucianism has enjoyed a steady revival since the 2000s. And this is something that I guess I try to do on the side. I'm trying to read um, Chinese contemporary art history, not through the key in lens or in in art historical terms, but actually as, as a manifestation of intellectual history, as a negotiation um, between the different uh, streams that you have in China until today, namely the new left, the liberals, and, and the neo-Confucianists. Um, so yeah, so I've done quite a bit of work also on the neo-Confucians. Um, what is um, relevant for uh, in the context of BRI is, of course, the notion of tianxia, which is, uh, which literally means everything under heaven, and historically, or purportedly historically, denotes a hierarchical world system where you had the Chinese empire at the center, um, and that uh, even though um, they were they were theoretically unequal, the tributary states that would enter into uh, this Tianxia system, which China would nevertheless gain benefits from this um, uh, asymmetrical uh, arrangement. Um, but you also have contemporary scholars like Zhao Jingyang arguing for a Tianxia um, as the ideal for global governance beyond uh, international politics today. So nowhere else are the impulses between the geospecificity and internationalism more conflicting and, and now we're going to revisit the faded legacies of internationalism.
maybe yeah yeah so the those who uh, uh, subscribe more to an internationalist politics um would uh commit to uh, um, uh, this anti-imperial anti-colonial project largely internationalist project often connected to the legacy of i mean we can go back to the third uh, international but uh in the last 70 years or so we had uh the bandung conference um in 1995 uh, 1955 where um where you had a, a, a alliance of non-aligned um, countries um, broadly committed to an anti-imperial project, um, and that uh, kindled um, lasting um, ties and Jew imaginations among those uh, third world countries. And you can see manifestations of that in literature, in visual culture, such as in this poster, in film, in music, in art. Um, this is, are we going to take too long if I go into um, the uh, details of it. Um, one aspect is, of course, was it actually, was it truly um, a, not even multilateral, was it truly bilateral? Because what you can actually observe from cultural artifacts of the time is more the projection of one nation towards the other and the projection of this one nation um, into an imagined international community, um, such as what you can see in this um, poster arts um, in China from the 50s and 60s, where usually you have um, uh, the Chinese workers or revolutionaries uh, yeah, wearing secular, modern clothing, and then some African communities still in their um, traditional attires. So, so that's the sort of imagined international community um, that was going on. Um, and you also have um, questions like black facing and cultural appropriation at the time. But I think that's a much, it's a different topic uh, that, uh, that, that, that we can tease up today. Um, I think it will be in general interesting question to ask, was cultural appropriation okay? Back in the days when you had when you had this platform of uh, internationalist uh, politics, um, you know, so if you look at the Tashkent Film Festival and and, and things like that, there were really um, you know things that you wouldn't do today. Um, and so so this was back in the heyday of internationalist politics, and this is what we have now. Right, this would be the sort of BRI propaganda. Um, art um, that still takes the same vocabulary um, from the time of internationalist um, the internationalist project, um, and obviously we will have uh, we will disdain for this kind of BRI propaganda today. But then, a another inconvenient question I think I, I want to ask, and, and really as a mental exercise here is, what if a contemporary China doesn't actually use this kind of propaganda, is this kind of obvious culprit of propaganda art um, uh, for the purpose of, um, of uh, promoting the BRI. But what if China actually adopts the critical contemporary art in its cultural missions uh, in the BRI project? Um, such a thing is not unthinkable. I mean, it has become quite unthinkable, unthinkable in the last few months. But uh, if you look back only in the early 2000s, you had any number of um, uh, communist party cadres uh, who, uh, I wouldn't say appreciated contemporary art, but who, who, who uh, definitely um, willingly supported critical contemporary art, including those that are mildly anti-regime because that was the spirit of contemporary art and that was the spirit of China at the time as China was accession into the w, uh, WTO and, and was willing to um, assert itself onto the, um, the global arena. So that's a um, hypothetical question, but I think if China were to adopt the sort of critical contemporary art, for example, from Liu Chong uh, in its BRI propaganda, what would the critics have to say about that. 
So I think um, in order to approach that, we have to um, notice how the underlying discourses have shifted dramatically from a socialist anti-imperial internationalist project to a renewed engagement with Tianxia, this restyled Confucian world order that propagates for a universalist empire without um, imperialism. And it is really my um, uh, wish uh, to, to nurture a kind of internationalist project today because we have so few of them. Um, so with the diagram that you saw earlier, we really struggled to come up with good um, internationalist projects, um, internationalist art projects. Uh, we have a few in the last few years where artists um, um, uh, uh, side with the underprivileged um, class uh, by looking at labor conditions, for example, of the BRI projects in the quote-unquote global South nations. Uh, we also have um, a project like this um, by a group of progressive um, uh, artists and uh, community organizers in Beijing, where they try to uh, side with uh, um, uh, uh, women in, in, in Kabul, and they temporarily uh, claimed uh, a park in Beijing. Uh, so they basically... Yeah, you can see the 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 the, the uh, uh, Baidu and Google map. They they claimed in the digital space um, a real park in Beijing um, as the Babu Garden. Um, but it still remains to be seen if this is enough today, and if this is if they, uh, this amounts to any kind of um, coordinated internationalist politics. Because um, I do perceive the possibility for any kind of internationalism in the contemporary art world today as quite um, major, um, because the social, the social political condition, or the or the institutional platform for internationalism is gone today. And for me personally, the last such thing was probably the the anti-globalization movement um, from the 90s, which uh, lived on in the World Social Forum in the 2000s. And it really peaked around the mid 2000s, um, where any number of um, social justice groups would get together and where there were, there, there's a sense of um, mutual emancipation in 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 being together and learning from each other in terms of what does it mean to organize themselves um and we can also go into a discussion about that later for me the problem of this past documenta was that it stages that kind of uh, aesthetics basically it stages the aesthetics of the world social forum uh without the political um possibility um, and some of the artists, the World Social Forum actually had a cultural program, and some of the artists were in, invited. Uh, Tarin Padi actually participated in one uh, edition of the World Social Forum um, when Ron Rupa actually declined the invitation by saying that it was too political for them. So such is the state of um, internationalist politics in contemporary art today, and part of that is has to do with the whole NGOization of art. Um, but I guess I also, uh, I don't want to say that don't take their money and, and, and you know, and just not do things. I think there's a, there's a, there's a possibility of being, um, being clear and articulate about where you get your money, what is the politics involved in that money, while still committed, being committed to local struggles. Um, before you ascend to this symbolic level of transnational um, art, or as Peter Osborne ironically puts it, the first transnational. Um, and I think that's actually it. So with this, uh, I guess, very um, uh, 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 diverse artistic materials, I, I really want to ask um, uh, a core question for today's 
art practitioners, which is how can we make geo-specific art that connects to a certain place and tradition, um, but how can we do that in emancipatory ways, um, right? That doesn't lend itself to populist politics. And then ultimately, what is um, the possibility for internationalism in the arts today? Thank you. Me, thank you. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, so I'm just going to ask a couple of questions to lead the discussion, uh, and then I'll throw it open. I'm going to keep the lights low so people can see the screen uh, more clearly. Uh, and I guess I just want to pick up, let, let me start with where you ended, and then go back to some of the, whether, uh, what kinds of art do the sort of cultural diplomacy that the Belt and Roads Initiative might also be worth spelling out some of the detail around Belt and Road, because I think some people here won't know, uh, will only know it by name. Let's not go into a lot of detail, but let's do, let's do a little bit of like outlining of what, what, it, what it is for the Chinese state in relation to its own internationalization. But at the end, you said that um, you didn't think there was an international in contemporary art. Uh, and I'm wondering why you say that. So, you know, um, just kind of very um uh, kind of intuitive way it seems like contemporary is highly internationalized the program here is, for example is like people from all over the world um yeah. lots of chinese students which kind of has relevance to the specifics of the practices you're talking about um but also people from argentina iceland all over the place right so that's one kind of but that doesn't seem unusual so of course the biennale circuit is prima facie, highly internationalized, and it's actually, you know, they happen everywhere. It's somewhat self-similar, but they also show artists from everywhere. So there's a kind of internationalism there. Art, the art fairs are kind of you know, great symbols of internationalism. Um, and also the major consumers of art, which are now the, the major big money museums, as well as a, 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 a global elite, like 1% is basically funding the art system, certainly in the, in the North and the West. Um, that's that's an international market. So it's kind of a, it's it's sort of perplexing on that basis for you to hear you say that you don't think the art world or contemporary art is sufficiently internationalized. I was wondering if you could sort of say a bit more about your reasons for that. Sure. I mean, I I guess I use uh, I use it very precisely. I use internationalism very precisely uh, as opposed to transnationalism or, you know, the global art circuit. So all of this transnational, global, that per pertain to the current global order, which is the capitalist global order, right? Where capital, um, as well as uh, goods and, and people theoretically, or they aspire to travel freely. Um, whereas the international list uh, project really has its roots in the, in essentially the communist project, right? So Kuomintang, Communist International, aka the Third International, um, as a one of the last uh, moments of a, a, a truly internationalist a bit uh, a repetition, but as a truly um, uh, large scale project uh, where you know the proletariats of the globe should uh, unite and fight uh, a common struggle which failed for many reasons um, and which, uh, you know, then the, 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 the communist the, uh, uh, block sort of split into different groups. You also had a force international, but that didn't have any traction. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, not everyone would agree that the World Social Forum and all this uh, anti-global uh, movements uh, are, a, a legal heir to that kind of internationalism, but that's that's the closest we have, right? In terms of a a truly um, uh, 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 a political project that is global in scope and that is uh, uh, locally situated and that has some um, positions that um, that they will not compromise, such as on the labor line and all of this. So, you know, I'm, I think I'm speaking with the whole leftist progressive, if not 
for historical sense, communist um, uh, 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 notion of internationalism, right? Versus, and then you can see the difference why the the celebration for the transnational and for the global, for all this free flow of things and people and ideas are but um, in many ways reactionary politics. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so international. I mean, I, I I think it was just two weeks ago um, that um, after all hosted a discussion on internationalism in the seventies, um, taking this group of artists uh, that were active from largely from the global south, um, but they were active uh, in in London, called artists for democracy. Um, and then looking at the, the the different tangents, such as you know how how uh, via uh, Cecilia Vicuña or David Mandela, you could connect to uh, true labor struggles and social struggles of Argentina and the Philippines of the time. Um, but I think, as I've said, I think we don't have an institutional um, platform for real internationalism today. I mean, not after. Um, the end of history as we know it. Um, and that it's, you know, sometimes it can get a little bit nostalgic when you look at, when you look back at all this uh, internationalist uh, cultural productions, say associated with um, the Bandung Conference in the uh, 50s and 60s or Tashkent Film Festival, which was Soviet sponsored, but still, gathered all the Afro-Asian voices in, in film. Uh, there was also a literary festival. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, if we go down that route, um, it's actually quite striking to, to reconstruct how some of the um, writers who hailed from, who had their, essentially had their socialization and their uh, coming of age through um, the third world uh, third World is Project um, at the Tashkent Literature Literature Festival, how some of the writers would actually end up in uh, U.S. universities in post-colonial departments where they would still more or less write about the same problem, but in a very sanitized way, right? Because we all know, I mean, essentially what happened in the um, NGOization of art um, happened a bit earlier in the... Um, uh, in university de departments where, you know, global South voices uh, get um, um, officially um, canonized in a way, but also loses with that, also loses its political um, power. Yeah. So, so that's, so the, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say that so at, towards the end, you were saying one of the reasons why um, contemporary art doesn't construct this emancipatory. So, Internationalism for you is this, has this emancipatory demand from from local constituencies that isn't about sucking up to the big money, which is transnationalism, approximately. Right. Um, but you also said that the NGOization of art gets in the way of internationalism. Could you just say a bit more around that as well? Sure. It seems yeah, to me yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'll take the example of um, of this past documenta. Um, you would think that when you have a lot of this global south, um, quote unquote global south uh, um, initiatives, because for me the global south is not a precise definition, you know, it's not a precise uh, holder of, of meanings, and 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 you always have to be a little bit more rigorous and ask, you know, what about class? What about you know levels of education? All of these associated things. Um, so you would imagine that a lot of these collectives do important work in local communities in emancipatory ways. But if you look a little bit closer, um, I'll give just one example of um, this initiative from uh, Tunisia <clears throat> called Awasha, which uh, is doing community art, public art uh, in the post regime change Tunisia. Uh, they receive um, quite some substantial funding from the U.S. Uh, embassy. 
Um, and which comes, of course, with a lot of uh, strings attached. One of that is they always have to publish everything they do on social media. And even if there were very few participants, they had to find an angle to photograph it so that it looks like it's well visited. And the whole idea is that you have to inspire um, the followers so that essentially uh, artists have to make lives more livable in Tunisia which arguably um, after the, the, the regime change had uh, deteriorated even further, right? And then the US embassy funding comes with us lots of other um, conditions such as you have to use uh, US connected uh, procurement. Um, uh, so you have to, yeah, essentially the money circles back to the same place where it comes from. And while in a way giving the impression that you know, artists are doing a service for the community. Um, so yeah, so do we want to say this is emancipatory politics? I guess not. And there, there, there are really quite a quite a few of such cases at this documenta, and and to the point that it really begs the question: is there is there not a an articulation or any even consideration? about politics um, uh, beneath this, um, this much wanted um, image of the community, right? Because the community doesn't, you know, doing things communal, doing things social doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing progressive mm. or emancipatory politics. You can be very much doing populist or right-wing politics um, under the same um, happy image of people celebrating. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask, gonna ask one more one more clarification question. Uh, it's so I, I then hear your uh, your your wish for so what what you seem to be emphasizing was uh, was geo imagination and art as as kind of um, amplifying or kind of consolidating adding to diversity of geo imaginations. Um, which are kind of coming up from constituencies and artists working in different regions. And you showed that within within the kind of disparity, the disparity within China seemed to be examples, what the examples you were presenting were doing, which is like people going from one part of China to another, thinking about what's happening in Western China, asking the question about whether this is a good enough portrayal of, of the concerns of people in Western China. Um, so I, I hear I hear the interest in in the specifics of like regionalization, more or less large re regionalization, as a way to um, build this international that you're talking about. Um, so you you did ask the question, and you left it. And you know, it was a kind of speculative question about how. Okay, let, let me let me start from another place. Um, so if if I was going to do a criticism of the Belt and Road Initiative as a cultural project, and you said at the beginning, the Belt and Road Initiative, it might be worth here explaining a little bit what that is and why it differs from Western modes of aid, and which is kind of the NGO model, I think. Um, so if, if I'm Chinese government and I'm saying, okay, we've got the Belt and Road Initiative, this is a way for us to have international influence, we need some cultural diplomacy also known as propaganda, to make, you know, to kind of build bridges and kind of show the Chinese state in good light and show that this is a good thing for China as well as for the people who, who are going to be um, benefit in, in their own terms from Belt and Road. We need a certain type of artistic image or film or music and, you know, what would from the West be called a global product. Um, and then you showed some images from 2005 of the, the painting of the, the happy African black guy dancing on the rail tracks, Chinese workers building, and that looks like a standard propaganda image, which is what we might expect from a critical art perspective. But you also said that, oh, actually, China can use critical contemporary art, the kind of things we do here, the kind of things you're involved in, in the Documentary Institute at Council, as part of a diplomatic initiative to support Belt and Road. And that, that seems a different criticism than the NGOization, like turning, turning, you know, NGO support for contemporary art, which is the way that 
uh, social goods that that NGOs support um, can get incorporated incorporated by states, and then these can align with the interests of uh, art initiatives, trying to support communities, and so on and so forth. So the Belt and Road thing would seem to require a different type of artistic practice and activity. But could you could you say a bit more um, what what that alignment would be between like a contemporary art model and a Belt and Road type of uh, encroachment from China around the world? Yeah, I mean, so the the the, the it, 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 right, it's intended as a provocation, right? When I say, what if China yeah. actually employs that kind of critical art for its BRI propaganda? Because that will be much smarter, and it will not cost them anything. You know, it will be that will be actually sort of the NGO logic in art, right? If they were smart enough, but of course nobody. Uh, is asking <laughs> people like ourselves to, 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 and of course we would, we also wouldn't want to be co-opted in that. So, so that's a sheer hypothesis and it's a provocation. Also to highlight the question: Is there anything intrinsically different, right? If we, if we um, take away uh, 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 the layers of ideology or you know the institutional affiliation of an artist, the milieu. If we if you only look at the, the 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 image, and if you only look at the, for me, mildly critical position, then it's um, you know is, are there fundamental differences between say this critical contemporary art tradition and all this state sponsored state sanctioned academic art tradition? So that's that's really a provocation. I think uh, we need a bit of such. Uh, Maybe soul searching <laughs> to 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 sharpen our own positions in a lot of these debates. Um, but to go back to the BRI, it is a yeah, it's been variously called the Marshall Plan um, of China for the rest of the world. It's true that it has usually the um, uh, the 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 conditions are much more favorable than say if you take a loan from uh, the World Bank uh, um, because that would demand all of these other NGO aspects such as political restructuring or public spend uh, you know uh, uh, restricting certain public expenditures and things like that. So China sort of seized the opportunity in the late two thousands. Um, there are many actually quite material reasons and economic reasons, such as China just has this huge current account um, surplus and the money has to go somewhere. There's no way for, for, for China to process that money domestically. So the money has to go somewhere else, right? And that makes sense uh, when you actually have a lot of overseas uh, investment. Um, and, and, you know, so sometimes in this very technical and economic um uh, analysis, you can see why, for example, the EU or 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 or, or America would simply not be able to put together a project of that scale um, that extends to so many um, quote unquote global South countries. Um, so, yeah, what else is to be said? Uh, there are a lot of port road. Uh, uh, port construction, road construction, pipeline for oil and for other critical assets. These are the 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 uh, uh, what the infrastructure um, uh, construction the construction of inf infrastructures um, is is largely about. Um, and of course, you would have um, uh, if you're an anthropologist and you go to the regions in question, you will realize that. You know, even though there's a lot of promise for economic um, benefits for everyone, a lot of times it benefits the national elites, classical story, the highway that, say, connects a region to another actually makes the local people that uh, 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 populate along the highway uh, even more jobless than before, because now people cannot stop on this dirt road, uh, but they go high speed. And things like that. Um, so it's quite contested internationally, um, also in terms of geopolitics, as then China would have access to some um, currently still commercial uh, uh, ports of commercial nature, which China may and can, um, should you wish, convert to navy uh, navy ports. Right. So you have a geopolitical calculus. 
um, there. And that's why, you know, put together, it's been quite contested. But then um, I've been following it quite closely. And sometimes you have to say, you know, there are also real benefits or, you know, when a country defaults, 90% uh, of the case, in if an African nation defaults on the debt, China actually usually rearranges or restructures the debt or gives an extension or sometimes writes off the debt. So, you know, if you do case by case study, we can really, we can really um, try to compare which one is more toxic. I mean, in any case, expansionist uh, projects are um, toxic, um, especially when it's connected to the energy sector and, and um, yeah. So, so that's the BRI. Uh, and, and I think the other critical dimension in the BRI project, which I uh, mentioned a bit earlier, is that it also gives China a certain uh, leverage in, in politics. Uh, for example, in Europe. Um, so uh, Greece has considered uh, or sold basically the share, majority of the shares to a port, the major Paris port to China. Um, one should also note that it had to sell the, the, the port because of uh, the Troika, right? The infamous uh, austerity measures that the European Union actually imposed on Greece. So Greece uh, sold that. And, and at some point um, it was bought by Costco, the Chinese uh, shipping company. And at some point, uh, uh, Greece uh, uh, parliaments of uh, uh, members of the European Parliament started um, speaking in favor of China on questions like human rights. Right? And such things have also happened uh, with Hungary uh, to some extent. And it's that level of um, geopolitical uh, political um, meddling that I think we need to pay a lot of attention to. Um, so yeah, so I guess all of these are political <laughs> monitoring rather than anything artistic. Um, and, and and maybe that's maybe that's the maybe that's uh, you know I, I think you know broadly if you look at all these artistic positions um, maybe it's also not possible to to or tenable to have one position from where you critique everything and you, you'll be able to penetrate everything. Um, so I don't know if it, it should actually fall to the shoulders of artists to to um, to to think about all of that in their in their um, in their artistic practice. But I do feel that we we lack a lot of political articulation uh, these days when it comes to um, a project like this when, when it comes to um, articulating or, or or finding one's own position in internationalist politics. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I haven't. Yeah, I guess I I was not able to give a a good example on a truly internationalist um, art project that critiques the VRI in its complexity. Rather yeah. than yeah, rather than the sort of the easier or the more convenient critique, such as on environmental impact of yeah, I think my question is more about the, the, yeah. the alignment between contemporary art and BRI, BRI rather than critique. I mean, the critique would be the thing we'd expect. I'm just going to see if are there any questions from this question over here, and we'll go with that and maybe open up some others.
I couldn't quite make out what was that. So can you can you uh, reiterate the question? Uh, uh, the second question was about the comparison. Okay, just help, help me out here. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so the the second question was a comparison between the BRI propaganda type of art practice and uh, a kind of more Western model of NGO type art. Uh, and if you could give an example, I think you were asking for the BRI propaganda type of practice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so whether the Chinese funding is doing direct state funding of artists, you know, with this with this kind of building Chinese cultural influence. And then the first question was an expression of disappointment with your talk for reasons I don't remember. Um, I do remember that. But... Okay, so the the when when you when you're articulating critical caution about we need to pay attention to the uh, reach of Chinese capital and Chinese influence, uh, for example, in buying up European assets like ports and so on. Uh, the question is like, who's this we that you're talking about? Who's the we that should be asking that question? Can you just say a little bit more why why you ask that question? What what's what do you, what's going on with that? Um, okay. So so the the question about the we that puts this critical stance around what the what the BR is doing geopolitically is connected with Chinese exceptionalism? Um, okay, <laughs> these are huge questions. Um, Welcome to Goldsmiths. Yeah, no, no, it's great, it's great. It's um, Goldsmiths way. I, I mean, I, I think for one thing, I mean, of course, you know, as a person or as we, as I suppose some kind of a, a layer of um, probably not internationalist intellectuals but cosmopolitan globalist intellectuals today um i think it's kind of an you know it's already a consensus um as to the damage of all the other iterations of um you know that trap and the problem of uh, developmentalism and and the problem of, of capitalism broadly, right? You know, I think I suppose this is this was also the the topic of the last three sessions. So for a bit of diversif diversification, I think we could talk about something um, that um, looks different but may not be that different um, in 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 in. In this content, but you know, but then that's that's also the thing. There is no there is no easy position in these questions. You have to be super clear about okay, are we talking about the um, the sheer ecology, uh, the sheer economic uh, rationale? Are we talking about only the geopolitical rationale? Um, because a lot of times things don't add up and, you know, what would appear logic. I mean, basically, you know, talking to, say, the Chinese Academy of Social Social Sciences, uh, which is sort of the um, think tank or, you know, brain power for a lot of the policies, like talking to the researchers, they, they, they say the BRI doesn't add up. Like there is no rationale for that. Um, 
but still the state still does it, right? Um, so, so, so that's for the, that's for the BRI, and as for the we, I think it, yeah, it, it is it is a bit difficult because I wouldn't know. It could be a good question to to maybe do a mapping of um, um, the uh, intellectual engagements with uh, with the BRI in the global south, because I mean I do track a little bit. Uh, intellectual debates in Russia and all that, and obviously you have uh, those who are very pro China um, and for good reasons. But you might also have a layer of intellectuals who are truly non-aligned, right? So, if you, for example, if you look at the position of Brazil these days, uh, I think they're they're quite non-aligned um, in. Uh, uh, as far as the geopolitical uh, fallout uh, is concerned between China and the U.S., and uh, by extension also this uh, Ch Ch Chinese-led um, infrastructure project. So yeah, so I think there's a lot of uh, intellectual mapping to be done, um, and and of course in each local context you would have uh, those who are uh, nationalist. And who wants to is who wants to see their nation as part of some kind of league, um, and and that league may be um, a Chinese-led league, uh, but also maybe something um, else. And so yeah, so all these motivations has to be have to be um, carefully uh, uh, um, examined. Um, what's another uh, question? There's a question for yeah. you. Does somebody else want to ask anything? Questions? There's a question from uh, Sutek B and then David. Anybody else? That's, that works. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am mostly so I'm going to ask a clarifying question. Um, I'm, 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 I think from what I understand, I think it's called like the difference between here, like, um, doesn't get to be as important as like international stuff, is that internationalism like, is supposed to be like separate to like the world's nation states in many ways, or is that not? <laughs> did, you, did you catch no, that? No, no. Okay. So the question, the, like, can I, I'll, I'll rehearse it. Yeah. You tell me if I get it wrong. Um, so the question was about your distinction between geospecificity and internationalism, and whether geo the the, as, the internationalist side of it uh, is to be advanced because it ignores nation state configurations, like nation state capture, whereas geospecificity can sort of lead into you know, nation state capture. Yeah. Okay. That's that's the first draft of the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think to to some extent, for sure, um, it's just you know of all the different formulations of a post nation state politics, we more often than not um, end up with uh, worse uh, variants than the nation state, right? So you, I mean, okay, we're in Europe still, you guys not. <laughs> that, maybe the European Union could um, to, could emerge to become a, a good example of, uh, you know, something that stands above the nation state. But usually when you go post-national nation, nation uh, national state, you go uh, imperialist expansionist politics, right? So that's, that's, that's why, you know, it's not a, it's not an easy, um uh, uh question to answer is uh you know because we also have very few good practice best practice examples for for uh something that stands above um uh, uh, the nation state but is of a you know of, of a kind that actually uh uh uh, uh puts in motion some kind of you know, post post national politics. Um, we do have some examples. Yeah, we do have some examples of uh, below the level of you know level of below nation state. You have municipality 
to municipality politics and things like that, that could be interesting. So, you know, I would also consider that a form of internationalism in the making. Um, that's that. And, and then actually, I think maybe to go back to the previous question, to the disappointment, I think part of that has to do with the position that uh, that I myself, and I think a lot of uh, people who share my um, ideas, um, that we have to take because we also don't have an easy position. Like we could be leaning towards the new left as opposed in the in the in the West, but there is not a coherent new left position between the borders. So if you were new left in the West, you will be kind of a statist in China, right? Um, and that's the sort of conceptual slippage that you know that makes a lot of discussions quite difficult because you have to constantly recalibrate all of what it means, uh, all of this uh, um, uh, uh, hidden um, the mismatchings and all, all of these connotations, what, what your new left can mean for our context. Okay, do you have a follow? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I guess therefore, like, um, you yeah, have the idea that it's quite expected to work so well level of music. But it's sort of more below it, it's also kind of like uh, also raising it. I'm, I'm not going to write for this, but unempowering it, but it's not overthrowing it. You don't challenge it. Yeah, that, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, and so, like, I suppose now I'm, I'm wondering if you have to sort of acknowledge sort of problematic things we live in, um, but then the idea of overthrowing it can be too okay so before the spiral at the end the the question was uh okay so if if the geo specific imagine this geo imagination built on specificities which happens within within nation states so i think that's what was going on with the early examples of this changing um uh configuration or uh display of what happens within china in relation between the han and the, the western the west of china uh, but if you're kind of working at this much more regional sub nation state level, that that doesn't challenge the nation state. So what 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 is the effect of doing that geo specific imagination in relation to the still very dominant power power mechanism? Do you just leave it alone? Do you try and go around it? So what what's going on in that? Uh, what what kind of critique of the nation state is that? I guess challenge. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a that's a good one because it sort of I mean that's that's essentially the problem today, right? A lot of this um uh, and, and and certainly in the critical art tradition, a lot of the art that takes that turn uh seems to actually get more and more navel gazing and you know look into the deep traditions. Well, you know, you can you can say that you have a different epistemology or you have a different tradition of technology, it doesn't mean that the rest of the world is going to go with you with that um, with that uh, notion of the technology or I don't know, it would not be a viable technology. Right? So there's a lot of that going on and I recognize the, uh, uh, the sense of uh, um, powerlessness in that. Um, I guess um, in terms of uh, um, politics below the nation state, I mean, to be precise, I think that kind of artistic position, they don't actually amount to a political position, right? It's kind of nice to do contemporary art in that register after the, um, you know, the, the turn of uh, cosmopolitics, uh, cosmotechnics and all of that. So it's kind of nice to do, it's, but it's not political. Uh, I think uh, Ikoi would also agree that it's not that political. Um, the sort of politics that might happen that, and that will be, be will hopefully um, amount to something will be something like, you know, back in the days of um, the refugee crisis in Europe, um, you had uh, national governments, many national governments on the conservative side, but you had actually municipal municipal governments um, uh, pushing through a more progressive agenda for accepting refugees, right? So all of a sudden the city of Palermo, Gdansk, 
um, Madrid, I think, they started accepting more refugees than their national government would mandate them or would even allow them to. So, so that sort of politics, I think, is interesting. Um, but you know, that's there's not an artistic expression for that kind of politics yet. I don't think. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question over there. Uh, uh, I'll I'll rehearse the question. Okay. <laughs> you can. Um, I think uh, what's interesting about the, the talk and uh, the questions that fall after these people is like uh, the problem of a common shared uh, round of values in the art world or in critique in general. Um, so, like you, you entered the discussion sort of talking about internationalism in the in the traditional communist sense, but uh, in the West and in the art world, that's already been, I guess, sort of forgotten. And uh, I guess what was sort of revealed from Sale's question is that uh, the, the politics in general of the art world is, is sort of a liberal politics. So, I'm wondering if. Uh, if this sort of internationalism you're talking about is uh, about creating a new ground of values to have this discourse, um, is this like something that would happen around uh, a, a labor movement, or is this like a artistically post focused international or something? Um, and whether or not the art world in general is like the place for it, because it's essentially uh, a liberal oriented politics that dominates. All right, uh, I'm going to try and summarize that. Um, so the question was essentially about um, what what would the internationalism of the art world be now? So uh, it started with the premise that in your talk and kind of in the questions as well, there's a kind of assumption of a common shared brand of values of like contemporary art critique and so on. Um, and the problem with the internationalism that you're describing from mm -hmm like the mid 20th century is that essentially it's done in contemporary art. We've forgotten about it. It's, it has some minor representations, but it's not a common ethos anymore. Um, so the question from David was about the politics of, uh, but yeah, the politics of this um, internationalism you're calling for and whether that requires a new ground of values uh, in the broad discourse. Is it built on labor movements? Is it artistic? Uh, it seems very different to the art world as we have at the moment, which is essentially liberal. Mm. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't have an adequate answer to that, um, but I, I feel um, for one thing, uh, we need to be, okay, I think, I think I myself also have to be a bit more open <laughs> to uh, different forms of uh, political uh, mobilization organization today. I think, you know, generally those who um, um, come out of age through some kind of, you know, old leftist um, political agenda are are quite, uh, find it hard to adapt to, say, the sort of social justice based. Uh, or, you know, you look at like uh, Fridays for Future, right? What, what do you make of that? What, what do the leftists make of that? But I think certain um, real uh, alliances have to be made. Um, but I think one um, crucial thing to bear in mind is that uh, it takes a lot more to do organizational work than to do activism. And we really have to uh, understand what it takes to move from this mode of activism and as activism as it is manifested in the sort of liberal global art circle these days is a sort of armchair critique on a lot of things. We really need to move from that position to um, understanding um, a position where you understand how to how to how to build um organizationally and how do you build institutions? I mean, I'm, not, I'm not talking about our institutions, obviously, but social institutions that would endure and that would uh, have uh, have a life in it in, in its own. So I guess, you know, I, I, I don't have to agree with everything that the Jacobin people, uh, the Jacobin Mac, Mac people in the US are doing. But one thing that recently was that 
um, they realize that it's it's quite impossible for them to do internationalist politics these days, and that's why they actually go back to U.S. specific specific um, you know labor line politics. And I think it's a fair assessment to uh, the state of internationalist politics today, and also to to be quite. Um, to be quite uh, 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 realistic, but also real about what your politics, because then you can really get your hands on that politics, it's not in the symbolic order of uh, a, a, a certain transnational alliance. So I think some of that spirit might be useful for the art world today. So I think, uh, can I see if there's any more? Just, I'll ask a closing question. No, okay. So, oh, you got, Faye's got one. Okay. Okay, so the question is why why are you holding on to and advocating for internationalism given all the problems you've described? And also whether there are other artists or curators or practitioners, I think, because your last answer was suggesting going looking outside of the art system, uh, that you could that you know you could call on. Mm. But I think the question is essentially about sort of why why persist with this internationalist idea. <laughs> okay, one has to believe in something, I guess. <laughs> and being being a, a doctrine in some kind of Marxist, uh, the the better kind of Marxist ideology. I didn't have to go. Oh, all all Marxists. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean we are. I guess we're we're very. Um, uh, sensitive to questions of ideology and and you know there might always be a position where that reproduces the condition <laughs> and, and, and and what we're believing so um yeah i mean i don't i i don't think i have necessarily um um uh maybe a, a better strategy to take than anyone else but um i think Perhaps one place to also go back to what I said earlier, this uh, move from activism to organizational work. I think one possibility uh, is to actually do it as political organizational work and not necessarily as art. Art can come in as a tool or art can come in as um, certain um, um forms that help the, I mean, not to just illustrate a cause, but also to maybe tease out some of these affective dimensions when you do this very uh, 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 soul-breaking organizational work. Um, so I think there are places for art in that, but I think my, I would tend to say that we should do it actually as political organizational work rather than we should do it as art. And this is something that uh, I myself uh, at Documenta Institute, we have initiated a little bit starting last year. Um, uh, we've been working for a year with uh, a political um, organization that uh, works on precarious labor, uh, migrant and mobile worker rights, uh, looking at, of course, platform workers, but also tech workers, aviation workers. Um, bringing them together to learn from each other, but also to have this curated moments where you have artists engage with them and to help them discover some other aspects about themselves or about each other that they wouldn't otherwise um, find in the moment of political uh, organization. So that has been quite uh, moving actually, and we've been getting really good feedback from the political organizers because all of a sudden, through doing uh, contact improvisation, they 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 could relate to each other differently, right? So, um, 
sorry, that sounds a little bit like self-promotion perhaps, <laughs> but I do think maybe to translate my uh, my reflection into also actions, that will be a, a place to, to start. Yeah, so I was going to, I mean, my, my question was a similar one about um, when we were talking earlier and we come to it through the questions, you were saying how you moved we're kind of pivoting away from curatorial practices to do with exhibitions, kind of contemporary art system, biennale structures, to thinking about working through organizations and organizations specifically. From your talk, I was wondering if that was a way to think about building, because you kept on asking sort of what, how do we build platforms for what you're calling the international? I think we could call it other things, but, you know, obviously for historical and good Marxist reasons, you want to stick with internationalism and you should. Um, so it, it sort of felt, you know, I think you've explained how platform building can take place and why it's important given the context of both NGOization and the kind of Western state-sponsored soft left liberalism model or a kind of uh, state advocacy model on a BRI-sponsored mission um, and, and this international platform building sits in between. But what I was, you know, I think partly a response to the last moment was also, well, organizations can happen anyway. We don't necessarily need an art contribution. So I was going to ask, what does art bring into that platform building or what does it bring into organization building? I think you kind of came to that towards like in the last question. It's sort of because it sort of feels like, well, this is just a standard political issue of like, how do we organize newly? But it, it does feel like there's something to be gained from uh, like an artistic initiative in that. So I'm just wondering if you want to endorse art a little bit more for the sake of the <laughs> emerging artists and curators that I hear, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> what about self-promotion? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I also have to justify everything right that I do. So why not do it simply as a, a political organizer? Right. So there are certain, you know, we've been, you know, it's nowhere close to, to being a sort of toolkit yet. But I think, you know, working with all this more affective dimension could be a way to go or, you know, finding all these other meanings to political organization beyond the, the sheer, um, you know, the really hard work of uh you know putting workers council in place and things like that um so yeah so i guess yeah and then in some other context you might want to um experiment with different methodologies and all of this so i think there are some tools but obviously they're still in the making and uh Maybe we should uh, regroup in a year's time or something to see how far we have come on our ends. Yeah, I think it's dimension of imagination and experiment that artists can bring with them. Uh, okay, with that, I think we should finish. Thank you. Thank you, me. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll see you in three weeks for the next series. Um, and I'll contact you soon, me, with follow up <laughs> thanks a lot <laughs>